Real Ghost Stories Online. The start of a new relationship can be a fascinating time. It's a time of many firsts, some of which can be uncharacteristic of the people living them out. At times, these firsts can take a couple to unknown and sometimes haunting locations, like the ones we hear about in this story. In what should have been an exciting and bizarrely romantic adventure, through a once grand but now dilapidated hotel, a couple wound up finding more than just broken windows and peeling plaster. One of them felt and experienced the presence of former guests who never checked out. What message did this dead guest have for the date? And why were they making themselves known to only one of the date participants? And did this experience help or hinder the relationship? Andrew shares this haunting experience from his younger days. At the time of this story, I was a photojournalist in Dallas-Fort Worth at one of the TV stations. One of my favorite things to do was short video essays of old buildings. I've always been drawn to classical architecture in North Texas. There's not a lot of it. While covering news stories out that way, I was always fascinated by a hotel that was something of a white elephant in a nearby small Texas town. It was 14 stories tall with hundreds of rooms, a massive tower, and spooky but beautiful Spanish colonial architecture. The hotel was opened in the first part of the 20th century to take advantage of the natural health craze. During that part of the century, the area's natural mineral water with its small amount of lithium drew people from around the world, with many guests staying for months at a time. All of the A-list movie stars from the 1930s through the 1960s stayed at this hotel. Bonnie and Clyde were said to have their last steak dinner at this hotel before leaving for their final shootout in Louisiana. Like many old abandoned buildings, this one had many tales surrounding it. Some true, some not. This hotel closed for good in the early 1970s. After contacting the property manager and asking for permission to do a video essay... I went and was not disappointed. I interviewed some people that had worked there in its heyday. The video turned out great. My goal had been to record the history and architecture, not to do a ghost story. The ghost story happened a couple years later. It does seem some old buildings lure people to them. This hotel drew me in. I became good friends with the building manager and the locals that gave the tours on the weekends. Before I knew it, I was doing tours every Saturday. This lasted for two and a half years. It was a blast taking people around the hotel. Many locals on the tours had their own stories about the hotel and its prime. Most had never been inside, catered to the elite. During the holiday season and my final few months at the hotel, it was decided that the maintenance man and I would hang Christmas lights on the exterior of the building from top to bottom. It was quite an undertaking for two people, but we did it. I ended up on the floors I had never been to before, securing lights to the window frames. It was creepy, but nothing strange happened. I'm sure I muttered a few times into thin air that I was just working. I would be gone soon. The lights went up without a hitch, and the hotel looked amazing. For the first time in 30 years, this amazing hotel was lit for Christmas. Up to that point, I had not been at the hotel at night. It was different at night, to be sure. At that time, the grand lobby was still in decent shape, with the darkness and the chandeliers lit, and the dust and water damage faded away. You had the feeling at any moment a bell captain would tap you on the shoulder and politely offer to take your bags. I was proud of the Christmas lights and wanted to show them off to a girlfriend I'd only been dating for a couple of weeks. I didn't know her that well, but I found out much more about her after a trip to the hotel. So, on a cold December night, Emily and I arrived at the hotel. I'll confess that I was nervous about being in the hotel at night, but as the man, I put those fears aside. As long as I had a flashlight, I told myself I'd be okay. Note that I've been from the top to the bottom of the hotel and never saw or heard a thing. If I did, I would not have come back. There were times I felt like there were spirits around, but they seemed to like me. They knew I was only there to help. I can say there were times on some of the floors not used for tours that I felt like I was almost walking through a crowd, but nothing ever tried to show itself or scare me. It would have been quite easy. 
It's impossible to get out of the hotel quickly from the upper floors. The only exits are an old hand crank elevator and the dangerous cramped fire stairs. The hotel looked amazing as we got into town. You could see the lights from miles away. I was excited to show her the place. It was going to be a good night. My fellow tour guides had turned on the lobby lights for me earlier in the evening to make it easier to navigate. The breaker boxes were in a room off the lobby that I did not like. I couldn't tell you why. It just felt wrong. But there we were, in the lobby at night, with the whole place to ourselves. I showed Emily around the hall. It's quite beautiful, with massive Spanish iron chandeliers and eerie gothic plaster faces looking down from the pillars. She seemed interested, if not a little distracted. I could understand, but I was staying strong. Figured if I got nervous, she'd freak out. After the lobby tour had been completed, I ushered her to the original hand crank elevators, art deco doors and all, and headed to the top floor for a tour of the cloud room, with its windows that overlooked the city, and then onto the tower. We stepped in. I moved to my left to operate the crank. As I looked up, I noticed that she was wedged in the corner diagonal to me, as far away as she could get. I thought this was strange. She was a good six feet from me. She looked uncomfortable, but I carried on. I have a tendency to overlook the obvious. I left the doors open so I could see which floors we were passing. Each is marked on the concrete wall as you go by. Floor after floor, speed by. I slowed to the top floor. Emily stayed in the corner and said nothing. All the levels were marked with numbers in white paint, but oddly the top floor said cloud room in red. Trying to be funny, I said, red rum. I found out later she heard murder. Emily had never seen The Shining. She must have thought I was nuts. So there she was, 14 floors up in a dark, abandoned hotel with someone saying, murder. Fun. We got out of the elevator and I showed her around the cloud room. She stuck very close to me. I could tell at that point she was freaked out, but I was determined to show her the tower, which is accessed from that floor. I didn't know at the time that getting back in the elevator was the best thing we could do. She knew. I'd find that out later. After a short look around the cloud room, we headed behind the elevators through a dark hallway that led to the tower access. I thought the tower would be romantic. Remember what I said about missing the obvious? The air was tense at this point, but nothing had happened that would turn me back. Honestly, if I had thought something was up, I would have been out of there. I just thought she was nervous about being in this spooky building, but a man carries on, right? With a flashlight lighting the way, we made the turn for the hallway to the tower. She was behind me. About halfway down the hallway, she literally jumped on my back, damn near knocking me over. She scared the shit out of me. I asked her what was wrong, and she only said that she heard something behind us. Being only steps away from the stairs to the tower, I carried on. Poor girl. I wanted to get to the top and show her the 35-foot windows that overlook the city, and I must admit I wanted to see them at night, too. The tower is super creepy even during the day, so you can only imagine what it's like at night. The lower portion of the tower houses the old-fashioned original motors and electronics for the elevator and a spooky water tank, the perfect setting for a mad scientist's laboratory. In the middle, a spiral metal staircase leads up to the top of the tower. Well, we didn't quite make it up all the way. Emily stopped about halfway, only steps away from our destination. I could tell she was ready to get the fuck out. There was nothing romantic about any of this. I didn't press on moving forward. We made our way back to the elevator. Again, she pushed herself diagonally away from me into the corner of the elevator. It seemed even stranger this time since she was stuck to me the entire time we'd been on the top floor and in the tower. We made it back to the lobby, no problem. It was a relief to be away from the darkness of the upper floor and have an exit inside. Back in the light of the lobby, I could tell she was ready to get out of there. Both of us laughed a little uncomfortably. She wanted to step outside. We sat on the steps, both relieved to be in the fresh air. I asked her if she was okay. What she told me she saw and heard was disturbing. When we first went into the elevator, 
she saw three people standing in the middle, two women and a man, dressed in clothes from the 30s or 40s. They were as real as you or me. That's why she was pressed into a corner. She told me they were caretakers of the hotel and that they knew me and were curious about why I was at the hotel so late at night. She said they were not there to be harmful, but from her perspective, they must have been frightening. With all this said, we can assume that this girl was seriously empathic. Like I said earlier, I didn't know her that well. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But it fit with what I saw in her actions. She told me that when we were in the hallway to the tower and she jumped on my back, she had heard a sound like feet dragging along the concrete floor, like someone was floating in the air with the toes of their shoes just touching the floor. Creepy, right? She said that the caretakers had followed us the entire time back onto the elevator and into the lobby. As we sat outside in the cold air, with the lobby in sight, through the tall wood-paned windows, I asked her if they were still there. She looked over her shoulder and said they were gone. Gotta tell you, my hair was standing up all the way back to the city. We stopped dating soon after our little tour of the hotel. I don't think the ghost had anything to do with it. It was probably the red rum comment, but you never know. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Want a commercial-free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories? Sign up at Apple Podcasts right now and try it for three days free. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories.